Hello and welcome to Church Reimagined. My name is Meredith Cook and I'm married to Travis Cook, one of the assistant ministers here. And these are two of our girls, Winifred and Harriet. Girls, can you say hello? Hello. 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 Welcome to church. A particular welcome to you if you are joining us for the first time, whether that's at home or at one of our sites at Glenmore Park or Malgoa. We are just really glad to be doing this all together, even though I know it feels a bit different and we're online. So it is so great that we can join together in this way, whether that's online or in person, uh, so that we can hear from God's word together. We're continuing our series in Mark and so that we can encourage one another and we can praise our great God. Let's pray together now for um, our time together. Yep. yep, hands together and close our eyes. We say, oh, dear God, we thank you for our church. And we thank you for this day that you have made. Amen. Even in times like these, perhaps especially in times like these, it is right for us to thank God for all that he has done and all that he is for us. Would you please join me in praising our good God with the words on your screen. Together, friends. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given, for life and health and safety and for the wonder of creation. Above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for your life-giving spirit and the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touched his clothes, I would be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Friends, are you scared of dying? You'd be crazy not to be, wouldn't you? Uh, you know, there are the edge of cliffs, there's great white sharks, there are pandemics. Um, it's, a, it's a natural thing to be, to be scared of death. Uh, crazy not to be scared of death. Um, but there are a lot of fears when it comes to death. Uh, you think there's um, the fear of the unknown, the fear for those that you leave behind, 
there's um, the fear of missing out on things. Uh, there's the fear of pain. There's the fear of being alone. Uh, the writer of the Hebrews actually describes the entire human experience this way. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2.15 uh, Those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now you just need to turn on the TV and you can see that. That this is the, the character of the human experience of those that live under the fear of death. Now what we look at it, see today, what we're looking at, uh, is just going to turn that upside down. Is When you have Jesus around, uh, you no longer have to fear and no longer have to fear death. And so uh, it's going to be a really important thing uh, as we look at this part of Mark's Gospel together. Now two weeks ago we saw an incident with the disciples where the disciples are crossing uh, the Sea of Galilee and a big storm comes up and they ask Jesus the question, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Now, in that incident, there's three questions that actually get asked. That question, does Jesus care? Uh, another question is, why are you afraid? How is it you still have no faith? Uh, so that's a question Jesus asked of the disciples. And then the disciples ask this question about who Jesus is. Uh, you know, who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? So you've got these three questions rattling around. Does Jesus care about the perishing? Uh, this other question, um, which is really a question about... Um, uh, who Jesus is, uh, who is this the wind and the waves obey him, and this response about Jesus as well, uh, why are you still afraid and have no faith? Uh, so those three questions are still rattling around as we hit today's story, um, this one. And those three, three questions, well they're really related because if the disciples, if they answer the question, you know, who is this, you know, he's the creator God who loves them, uh, then they wouldn't be afraid and they'd trust him and they'd know that he, he cared in that situation and could do something about it. So three really important questions to answer. Now, uh, today's incident, uh, today's incident actually builds on those questions and those questions, does Jesus care for the perishing, who is this, and can people trust him or will they stay afraid? Now, today's incident is broken up into two sections. Uh, it's one of the Mark and Sandwiches that we've seen. Uh, not just um, broken up for no reason, but broken up in such a way is that the two incidences relate to one another uh, and we can learn uh, how one impacts the other. Uh, so in, in these two incidences, we have uh, uh, two women um, uh, the being touched is important in the stories. Uh, the mention of 12 years is important. And death has reached out to both of them, uh, and they're both unclean. Uh, so let's get stuck into it. Now, the first uh, story uh, that we look at, this first incident, is about Jairus' daughter. Uh, the disciples have crossed over the lake, and we pick it up at verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. Now, Jairus sees something special in Jesus. He's travelled from one of the local towns to where Jesus is besides the lake and um, just sees that Jesus is the one who can help in this, this terrible situation with his daughter dying. Uh, uh, that Jesus can heal her. You know, Jesus can save her. Uh, and that word that's used stretches across those meanings, uh, the idea of healing her and saving her. And we use that vocabulary when we talk about doctors. Uh, doctors can heal someone, but we also might say that they saved someone. Uh, and that's going to be important for Jairus, uh, this idea of not just being healed, but something more than that. Uh, now, this is when we leave our Mark and Sandwich and we go to our second incident. Uh, you've got Jesus and Jairus, they're walking back to his house, uh, no doubt in some kind of rush to get there, but uh, they're interrupted uh, and interrupted by a woman who has death reaching out to destroy her. So have a look, uh, halfway through verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, Jairus, he was a significant member of the community, uh, the leader, the ruler of the synagogue. He's named in our text. Uh, but here we have this unnamed woman, uh, someone who would be shunned and shamed from the community. Uh, uh, now, will Jesus care for her? Will her voice be heard? 
Uh, and her life story is a sad one. Uh, this is not her monthly period we're talking about, but some kind of hemorrhage that's left her bleeding for 12 years. And uh, no doubt affected her emotionally, socially, and we, we're told how it's affected her economically. Uh, she spent all she has had, all she's had, and she's now desperate. Uh, on top of that, she's also unclean. Uh, the Old Testament law that governed her community says this, so Leviticus 15 verse 25, when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she'll be unclean as long as she has the discharge. And so this has been a scourge on her life for 12 years, a scar on her soul, removing her from the community. Uh, and she's heard about Jesus and sees the way that he could act to help her. Uh, verse 27. Uh, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. You know, if I just touch Jesus, then I'll be healed. Uh, you know, she's right. And that's exactly what happened. She reached out, she touches Jesus and immediately she, she, she feels that she's healed. Uh, she feels that in herself. And then Jesus surprisingly stops. Uh, verse 30. At once Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Now, uh, being touched by someone is pretty trivial given the circumstances. You know, they're rushing back to Jairus' house to look after his daughter. And you kind of think, well, what, Jesus, why are, you, why are you so concerned about this? And that's exactly the way the disciples respond. Have a look at verse 31. Uh, you see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? And the disciples are right, aren't they? It's just a trivial thing, given the uh, important uh, mission that they're on to actually get to Jairus' house. But Jesus keeps looking around, verse 32, to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And you got to think, what's going to happen next? What's Jesus going to say? You know, here's this unclean woman that's come and touched him, and that would make him unclean. And you think, like, like is he going to rebuke her? What's going to happen? Uh, a beautiful thing happens, verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Does Jesus care? Yes, he does. And with a tender word, he confirms what she's felt in her own body, that she is well. Uh, and what do we learn from this incident? Uh, what's interesting is that uh, she was thinking, as long as I touch Jesus, then I'll be healed. Uh, you know, some kind of, um, you know, even magic, you know, kind of happening. You know, that's what she might have been thinking. You know, if I just touch him, you know, his power. And yet Jesus stops and wants to make it clear what's going on. Not some kind of magical touch, but actually what heals her is him and her confidence in him is is so integral to that happening uh, so he's able to say no your faith has healed you that is you've come to me confident that i'd be able to heal you and i have uh, not some magical touch just me just jesus that's what it is your trust in me that's what counted and she becomes a model of trusting Jesus for Jairus and for us. So as we hit the next part of the Mark and Sandwich, she is a model of what it looks like to trust Jesus in this kind of circumstance. So let's keep going. Let's have a look. But you see, the problem is that this delay, of course, has had enormous consequences for the situation back in Jairus's house. And the news comes. Now, uh, these days you'd get a phone call, wouldn't you, from the hospital? And you know, you see the number and you think, you know, is it going to be good news or bad news? Uh, in this situation, people have come to Jairus and it's bad news. Uh, verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? An already desperate situation has resulted in death. That's it. Uh, a life cut short at such a young age, 12 years old, uh, a terrible situation, awful things happened. But Jesus responds differently, doesn't he? Uh, Jesus 
Does he care for those who are perishing? Yes, he does. Does Jesus have power to overcome death itself? Let's see. Verse 36. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. Now, he isn't saying, Jesus isn't saying to Jairus, uh, uh, you know, you need to have more of this thing called faith. If you have more faith, that's really going to help you at this moment. Um, he, he's not saying that. Uh, the word he's to trust in is this word, don't be afraid. Trust me. Don't be afraid. Trust me. Just believe. And the word belief relates to trust. And its object of trust is Jesus. Trust me. That if Jesus says, don't be afraid, you can trust him. So even with this terribly desperate, awful situation, Jesus says, don't be afraid. You can trust that word. You can trust that word, Jairus. Let's see what happens. Well, remember the request? The request that came early on was uh, from Jairus was, you know, if you put your hands on my daughter, she'll be well. Uh, how can Jesus now touch her? She's now a corpse, unclean. And if Jesus touch her, he will be unclean as well. Uh, what will happen? Verse 37. He did not let anyone follow him except for Peter, James and John and the brother, of, uh, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And of course they laugh at him, because it sounds like Jesus just doesn't understand what's happening. <clears throat> sure enough, she does look as though she's just asleep, because that's what a dead body looks like. But Jesus, don't you get it? She's dead. You know, that, that, so they kind of laugh in this awkward kind of moment. But for Jesus, death is not permanent. This is a temporary thing. Jesus can fix this. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Praise God. You know, is Jesus in charge? Yes. Is Jesus in charge even of death? Yes. Does Jesus care about those who are perishing? Yes. Who is Jesus? He's the one who has power even over death. And should you be afraid? No. Trust him. No need to be afraid. Now, in this incident, we see that the idea of healing goes way beyond the expectation of Jairus. You know, he was thinking, well, if Jesus comes and touches my daughter and touches her, then she'll be healed. But Jesus does much more than heal. He saves her, saves her from death, rescues her from it. And he is the one who can do that. He has authority over death. Now, there's another incident in the Gospel of Mark where someone wasn't saved from death. Someone you might have expected to be saved from death in the same way Jairus was, Jairus' daughter was, in the same way the woman was healed. You, you might have expected this one to be saved from death. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Jesus himself at the cross. Uh, at the cross, Jesus does not save himself. In fact, uh, the high priests and uh, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, uh, they mocked Jesus because they saw the fact that he healed others, saved others, same word, saved others, and yet he couldn't save himself. In fact, the fact he couldn't save himself, as far as they're concerned, was evidence that he was not the Son of God, he was not the Messiah, he was not who he claimed to be. Because if he did, he would have had power over death. God would have been on his side. So what do they say? Chapter 15, verse 31, halfway through. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. That same word. He healed others, but he can't heal himself. He saved others, but he can't save himself. You know, there's Jesus rescued his disciples from the storm, freed the man with the legion of demons, 
uh, rescued the, the woman with a hemorrhage and healed her, uh, brought Jairus' daughter back from the dead, but you know, he can't save himself. He's not really who he says he is. But Jesus didn't come just to make everyone's life a bit better. He didn't come to heal us from all our diseases. He didn't come to do all that right now. He came to defeat sin and death itself. He came to die our death, die the death that we deserve under God's judgment so that we could be saved from sin, saved from the judgment of God, so we could be rescued from that. That is, why was Jesus on the cross? Not because it was a lack of display of the power of God, but that was actually the power of God at work. Then the plans of God that Jesus would die in order to save others. An incredible plan for us. And what that means is that we can actually trust Jesus in the face of death. That he died our death, he's conquered death, he's risen to life and we can trust him. An incredible thing that we now have. Uh, that idea of being healed and saved is one that's obviously very precious and we think, you know, such an important thing to, in our lives. And, and I regularly pray for people to be healed and, and, uh, and, and be saved and rescued from death. But I know that God may well have a bigger plan at stake. And the most important thing is they trust him and for the forgiveness of their sin and have confidence in the resurrection of the dead, not to be saved from death, but to be saved through death, that there is the resurrection we look forward to. But there are Christians out there who think that no, God, God's plan is that we never suffer, uh, that if you have enough faith, then you will be healed. And if you're not healed, it's because you obviously don't trust enough. And let me tell you, that's a horrible distortion of the scriptures, uh, false teaching from the scriptures and doesn't understand God's plans and purposes for the Christian person. That Jesus does have power to heal. He can heal. He can choose to do that, but he might not. And we trust him in that. In the same way he entrusted himself to his heavenly father in the garden of the Gethsemane and on the cross, so too we trust him. And we say, not my will, but your will be done. And God's plans and purposes might be bigger for us. And so those physical things we're like taken away they still might live with us as Christian people. Well, uh, what about our three questions? Does Jesus care for the perishing? Absolutely he does. Uh, who is Jesus? He is the one who has power over death. He is God's son. He is God's king. He can do it. He can deliver us from death, bring about the resurrection of the dead. He can do it. And so do you trust Jesus or are you afraid? Do you trust him? You can trust him even in the face of death, even in the face of great difficulty and great challenge that you can trust him. Now, and it means that Christians actually do crazy things. They risk their lives in order to love others. They risk their lives in order to take the message of Jesus to others. They risk their lives in order to care for others. Not because they think their life is of no value, but because they have no fear of death, because they know the Lord that has authority over death, the one who brings their resurrection. No fear of death. And so they're free to serve others. They're free to love others. And because of Jesus, we're no longer slaves to that fear because we trust him. You have nothing to fear. You will not be alone. It isn't an unknown future that Jesus says you'll be with him and his people. You can trust those that you leave behind to your loving Heavenly Father who will care for them also. Uh, you won't face God's judgment and you will be with Christ's people. Do you trust him with your life? Do you trust him in the face of death? Don't fear, trust him. Amen. We hope that you have been encouraged and challenged by God's word today. Why don't you spend a moment now talking to those around you, whether at home or at church, about what God has been teaching you. There is always a next step that we can each be taking as we keep following Jesus. 
And if you want help to know what your next step is or how to take it, then the staff are always happy to chat. So you can contact them today or through the week. If you're watching at home, why don't you head over now to our YouTube channel. We have over 10 songs there that you can watch and sing along to so that you can keep praising God and responding to his word. And no matter whether you're here at church or at home, we look forward to you joining us again next week. Bye.